So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Anissa Benal. I'm a senior researcher here, here at the Academy. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, assist to this uh, very eminent and going to be a very promising and interesting panel. Uh, I have unfortunately to announce to you that one of the panelists couldn't make it today, which is uh, Jean-Baptiste jean jean and I have to read what he said because I think it's quite uh, funny. So, dear all, I missed my flight. Today is a day of, so he comes from Paris. Today is a day of rail strike, so I couldn't take the RER, so the train, to go to the airport. I took the cab, who told me the highway is closed because of the transfer of migrants. So it's the invitation of the Port de la Chapelle camp. So it would take me 90 minutes to get to the airport. Too late. What is ironic is that in both cases, it is human rights law that prevented me to come. <laughs> so, voila, I think he has a good excuse, especially if it's for human rights law, for the respect of human rights law. So, we will have today two panelists, um, whom I will introduce right away. And then the idea is to have a lively discussion. Uh, it's a difficult topic. We are going to talk about uh, the use of force uh, against individual uh, members of armed groups. What is the legal framework applicable to this use of force? Um, so we have about one hour and a half. Uh, so we have some we have some time to discuss this. And of course, I will uh, leave uh, available time for uh, for you to also ask uh, questions to our two panelists. So I'm going to present to you um, the first panelist, who is Anthony Zwerke, on my right. So Anthony is a senior policy fellow at the European Council for uh, Research. The European Council on Foreign Relations. On Foreign Relations, uh, where he leads the organization's work in the area of human rights, democracy, and justice. Uh, so he has conducted research um, and written on European and US frameworks for counterterrorism. Uh, also on the European Union human rights strategy and, the, and on the pursuit of justice in the international response for, to mass atrocities. Before joining the European Council, Anthony was the executive director of the Crimes of War Project, an NGO that worked to raise public and media awareness on the, of the laws governing armed conflict. He has credited the book Crimes of War, What the Public Should Know. And also, also he writes extensively and often in different uh, magazines and newspapers, among which my favorite one, which is The Guardian. Um, but he also writes uh, for El País, The Washington Post, uh, The Times Literary Supplement, Foreign Policy, and so on and so forth. So very welcome, Anthony. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to hear your thoughts. And then, of course, on my left, Marco Sassoli. Uh, should I need to introduce him? But I will, in any case. So Marco is a professor of international law at the Law Faculty of the University of Geneva. Uh, he was also, an, from 2001-2003, uh, professor at the University of Quebec in Montreal, where he is still associate professor. And uh, he is uh, um, a commissaire and uh, uh, alternative member of the executive council of. Uh, and he's also a special advisor on his own time uh, on uh, international humanitarian humanitarian law to the ICC. Prosecutor. 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 Yeah, because he, oh yeah, prosecutor. Sorry. So voila, we now know who is the panelist. I'm going to tell you a little bit how we are going to proceed. So first, Anthony is going to expose. Uh, some of his thoughts that he developed in an article that I encourage all of you to read. Uh, it's in open access. Um, the title is Individual, Not Collective, Justifying the Resort to Force Against Members of Non-State Armed Groups, which is here. So he's going to develop his thoughts here. Then I'm going to um, uh, put forward some thoughts from a policy point of view that we might uh, address um, some challenges that, uh, that his article raises. And then Marco uh, is going to, uh, to uh, speak uh, at the end of, of, uh, of the session uh, to um, explain or counter and put forward his own views. So Anthony, the floor is yours. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit what 
are the thoughts that you developed with regard to uh, using human rights law as the justifying framework for the use of force in non-international law? <coughs> Thanks very much, Anissa. Um, and for me, really, it's a pleasure to be here in this lovely setting. Um, so I'm very grateful to the Geneva Academy for the invitation. Um, and this is a, a subject that I've been thinking about and writing about for a long time. This article took me a long time to, to work out my position. But really, um, as Anissa said, I've been, um, you know, for several years, have been working on looking at the, um, the U.S. framework for its military action against um, you know, Al-Qaeda and more recently ISIS in what it calls its war on terror, and then tracking the European initially response to that and then the European movement to, um, to launch um, their own European military campaigns against uh, these external non-state groups. Um, and thinking about, as you know, you know these kinds of campaigns States fighting against um, non-state groups, often external groups, have been, uh, you know, an increasing part of the kind of international scene um, since 9/11 in the last 15 or so years. Um, and yet, there's some of the questions that they raise, I think, continue to be quite disputed. Um, and particularly, if you think of questions about targeting, um, for instance, with drone strikes, you know, can you target an individual who's found away from the battlefield? which is often the case with these terrorist type groups, um, under what circumstances, what legal framework, and then the question of detention, um, which you know, for many of us is symbolized by Guantanamo, but there are wider questions as to what powers there exist um, to detain enemy fighters in these kinds of extended non-international armed conflicts. Um, and you know, tracking the debate, often it seems like the starting point really is to think um, is this situation an armed conflict or is it not an armed conflict? Um, and so there's this sense that, you know, if it's not an armed conflict, then the state has very limited um, powers as far as targeting or detaining people, um, which we're familiar with from the world of law enforcement. Um, but once it shifts to armed conflict, there is a sense that the state acquires much greater powers. Um, and, you know, the kind of background assumption is within the context of an armed conflict, the state has the authority to target those who have the, the status or who perform the role of fighters on the other side. It can target them based on their status, or it can detain them until the end of hostilities. This is a sort of, you know, background assumption, um, which often you see brought into the analysis of these kinds of situations. Um, and so once you establish that it's an armed conflict, somehow we shift into that kind of framework of debate. Um, and therefore, a lot of the discussion since 9-11 um, is really about, you know, what are the boundaries of armed conflict? What are the boundaries of the battlefield? Um, what forms part of the armed conflict and what doesn't? Um, and the second, you know, um, area of discussion, which we're going to be looking at quite a lot here, is to do with the role of human rights law. Because in non-international armed conflicts, it's generally accepted that human rights law is applying alongside IHL. Um, and, you know, does that impose any additional restraints on IHL? But the prevailing view, certainly from states, tends to be that human rights law may apply, but it defers to IHL, according to the doctrine of lex specialis, right, which many of you doubtless will know that that's the body of law that's particularly applicable in armed conflict. And so you end up, you know, certainly is from the point of view, as many states would see it, um, that once you're in an armed conflict context, that these powers to target or detain based on status or you know, function um, are what sets the limits on what states can do. And you know, for some of us, this is a somewhat problematic framework because it seems very um, permissive. <laughs> you know, it seems to allow the state uh, quite wide powers to target when it seems perhaps um, you know, difficult to see why it should be necessary to target in those circumstances or to detain, you know, in a way that becomes to see problem comes to seem problematic because the these conflicts can go on and on for years. Um, but you know, so what I try to do in my article is to develop a, an alternative approach. Um, and essentially what I try to do is to look not at IHL, which is providing the rules for the conduct of hostilities, um, but to look at something else which is um, what is the justification 
for the actions that states are taking. So I think, um, you know, I think that there's something a little bit odd about looking to the existence of an armed conflict, of a NIAC, a non-international armed conflict, to determine the powers of the state. Because in an international conflict, you know, we're very familiar with the idea that the existence of the armed conflict and the lawfulness of the use of force are actually different questions. You know, one is to do with use in bello, governing the conduct of hostilities, but the other is a use ad bellum question about the lawfulness of the resort to force. So you're not looking at the existence of the armed conflict um, or the application of IHL to say, is there a justification for doing this? Um, essentially, IHL is a kind of prohibitive regime that's imposing restrictions, but it takes the use of force kind of for granted. Um, and the existence of the armed conflict is just kind of a matter of fact. You know, it means the hostilities are going on, but it doesn't mean that one side is right or wrong. Um, and so, in a way, I think we should be asking similar kinds of questions in non-international armed conflicts. Um, you know, what, for instance, if uh, you know, the existence of an armed conflict is a state of, is a matter of fact, is to do with the basis, you know, the fact that hostilities are continuing, what would, what would there be to stop a state um, itself launching, a, as it were, an unprovoked military campaign against a group, an armed group, um, within its territory or in a, somewhere else, um, and then escalating that military campaign up to the level of armed conflict? You know, once it reached the level of armed conflict, would that sort of somehow make it okay? Because it's in an armed conflict now, and therefore armed conflict rules apply. To me, that shows that there is a kind of missing dimension here. And the missing dimension really is, you know, is the use of force in these cases necessary and proportionate to serve a legitimate purpose, a purpose that we regard as legitimate? Um, and so what I try to do in this article is to develop a, a way of looking at NIAC, so non-international armed conflicts that look at the state's justification for the use of force. Um, and I, the, the argument that I make is that this um, is found in human rights law. So, in other words, it's human rights law that um, makes a distinction between those actions on the part of the state that are justified as being necessary and proportionate to the defense of life or the restoration of public order and those actions that aren't. Um, so, you know, I think um, you can see, you know, if you look at a situation that kind of below the, the threshold of armed conflict, the state is confronting a group within its territory um, and it's targeting members of that group or detaining them, you know, clearly armed, uh, IH, um, human rights law is the framework that's assessing, is this a reasonable thing to do? right? Um, is it a violation of their right to life to target them? Well, it probably is unless they're threatening, you know, the, immediately um, the life of someone else. Is it a violation of their right to liberty to detain them? Yes, most likely it is unless you can meet certain kinds of criteria. Um, and the argument that I make is that that um, framework, that way of looking at the state's justification for the use of force um, actually continues into um, a situation of non-international armed conflict. Because the, once you cross the non-international armed conflict threshold, essentially you are adding um, a set of restrictions as to how you should carry out the fighting. But you're not adding any additional kind of authority, um, in my view. So I think that the authorization continues to be rooted in human rights law. And this means that, in a sense, we can develop this a lot more. But you know, the basic point is that the assessment of whether an action um, of targeting or detaining an individual within an international context is lawful. Um, within an armed conflict, it has to satisfy two tests. Number one, is it necessary and proportionate as a use of force to achieve one of the purposes that human rights law permits, which is essentially defense of life um, or the restoration of public order? Um, and then as the second thing, does it also comply with the rules on the conduct of hostilities under IHL? Um, and in my mind, that, you know, that sets a kind of threat-based um, framework for assessing the use of force. 
that exists independently of IHL and that might in some cases provide a more stringent restrictions on what the state can do. Um, so I should say that, you know, having established this basic framework, I think we also need to recognize um, that human rights law in, you know, looking at these texts when, it, <coughs> when it's um, a use of force, you know, not a violation of the right to life or when it's detention, not a violation of the right to liberty, it has to be sensitive to the context. So the more that the context comes to seeing um, a situation of, you know, really extended intense hostilities, then you interpret the requirements of the right to life or the right to liberty in a rather different way. Um, so in my mind, you know, when you're in a kind of battlefield situation, the, the requirements imposed by human rights law might converge rather closely with the requirements of IHL, um, because you can assume that the fact of someone being a, a member of the opposing forces justifies the, you know, allows you to assume that they're a sufficient threat, um, that you can target them without violating their right to life. And in fact, this is, um, as an aside, this is a position that the European Court of Human Rights has in fact taken in some cases. Um, but if you encounter that individual away from the battlefield, you know, the immediate threat that they're posing is less. And so even though targeting them might still be, you know, not prohibited under IHL, I think you can't say that it's justified as necessary and proportionate under human rights law because you might be able to capture them or they might be such a low level member of the group um, that it's, you know, that it's simply disproportionate to, to shoot the kill in those circumstances. So that's, you know, I could, I could say more, but I could, why don't I stop there? Because that's essentially the, the alternative framework that I'm proposing. Um, as a way of looking, you know, it tries to link back the use of force, not simply to the fact that is there an armed conflict, but is this particular action of targeting or detention necessary? Is it necessary and proportionate according to a purpose that, that we regard as legitimate? Um, you know, as, as opposed to just is it kind of part of an armed conflict and therefore it's okay. Mm. So perhaps, I, I know you, you'd like to, to, to stop here, but perhaps I can ask you, a, a, a few questions so that you can also perhaps develop a bit more so that um, the, the, the audience can also fully grasp uh, your position and then um, I can also speak a bit from the policy point of view. But so in other words, um, well, perhaps one question that, that would come immediately to mind is then in the context of an IAC, uh, how would how is the interplay between IHL and, and human rights in terms of the late specialists? Because if we understand you well, it means that in fact there, there is no late specialist theory applicable in IAX. Uh, so then, um, how, 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 how does it play in, 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 in a bit more in practice? Yeah. That's a good question. So the, the late specialist theory really um, is a way of resolving what is seen as a kind of you know, conflict or tension between the framework associated with human rights law and the framework associated with IHL. Um, and as Marco in particular has written, and I quote him in my article, you know, in many um, cases the, the requirements are overlapping, but there are two points of difference, um, particularly in the context of a uh, non-international armed conflict. Um, you know, and one is this question of whether um, targeting someone based on their status is um, is permissible, or, or the targeting always has to be based in some way on the threat that they pose. Um, and the second one is to do with detention. Does detention, you know, simply again go on the status of the person, or as human rights law would seem to suggest, does it have to be shown as, you know, necessary in that individual case? So, um, lex specialis is the idea that, you know, because we seem to have two regimes here, which are, you know, basically doing the same thing in terms of regulating what the state is up to, um, how do we decide which is the applicable one? Um, and then the lex specialis answer is, well, human rights law is a very general body of law, whereas the laws of armed conflict are very precisely tailored to the situation of armed conflict, and therefore in that situation they should take precedence. Um, my argument is, no, um, we should look at the um, structural differences between these two bodies of law and see that even in the case of a non-international armed conflict, they're actually doing something that's a little bit different. Um, so the human rights law is really 
as it were, regulating um, the state's, you know, um, lawful ability to use force against these individuals under its jurisdiction. Um, you know, in, before human rights law existed, essentially states more or less could do what they wanted to individuals under their jurisdiction, but human rights law imposes quite strict limitations on that. Um, and, you know, and therefore it's a kind of justification test, you know, is this necessary um, proportionate to a, a legitimate purpose? Whereas, um, you know, and that's in a way only applying to the state, right? Um, because the state, you know, is able to use coercive force against these individuals under its authority, under its jurisdiction, um, but only subject to certain limits. But the individuals themselves are never having the right to use force against the state. You know, that's always going to be prohibited under domestic law for them to kind of take up arms against the state. Um, so that's, in a sense, you know, the asymmetry. The, the, the individuals never have a legal right to, to rebel, whereas the state has a, you know, some legal right to use force against these individuals, but only when it's necessary. Um, and then I see IHL is doing something different. IHL is imposing restrictions, prohibitions on the conduct of hostilities. You know, if you're fighting, what can you do as part of the conflict? So in some cases, these will overlap. Um, but I don't see any tension with the fact that some action might be, you know, allowed under IHL, but still not justified as necessary and proportionate under human rights law. Um, and, you know, I think that's, in a way, that's true of um, the actions that the non-state actor is taking. You know, the non-state actor is, you know, maybe carrying out actions which are in compliance with IHL, um, but it doesn't, you can't say that it has a kind of legal right to take those because they're still illegal under domestic law. So in a sense, you know, we have these two kind of um, different legal regimes and because they're not doing the same thing, I don't think there is this tension um, that requires the kind of lex specialis rule um, to resolve that tension. Um, and I could talk a bit more about, you know, in how the situation is different in international armed conflict, mm. if you want to. <clears throat> Well, perhaps you can, and then uh, we can also try to link this with the, the issue of um, what kind of policy issue that could that can that could arise that could challenge. I mean, the the difference, to my mind, with you know international armed conflict, which is where the lex specialis doctrine really evolved, um, is that when you when you have one state fighting against another it's a kind of collective battle, right? The states are two collective entities, um, and the use of force is kind of authorized on a collective level. So if, you know, if you have a self-defense argument, if you are one state, say, um, Kuwait, and you've been invaded by Iraq, you know, you have a, a right of self-defense to use force against that country. Um, and therefore, because it's a collective, you kind of acquire the right to use force against all members of the opposing armed forces. Um, you know, the, the use of force operates on this collective basis. And I think that's why you do have a, in, in the case of international armed conflict, why you do have to look at a potential conflict with human rights, because here you have a, you know, a status-based justification. Mm -hmm. the, the justification extends to all members of the opposing army. Um, and that does set up a potential conflict with, with human rights law, but I think in non-international armed conflicts, that's, that situation is not arising. Um, because, to my mind, the authorization for the use of force continues to be assessed, you know, at least notionally, on an individual level. Um, and therefore, the, you know, the tension isn't there that needs to be kind of finessed with the Lex Specialis idea. Okay, so if I try to sum up at least this part of your, of your, of your article, uh, that somehow it exists a use ad bellum uh, at the interstate level, uh, and that the use ad bellum gives the authorization for states to intervene or to, to use force against another state, uh, but there doesn't exist any use ad bellum for uh, internal conflicts, for NIACs. So in, in somehow human, right, human rights law could be taken as a form of use ad bellum for NIACs. This raises a lot of challenges, particularly for states who are intervening uh, in extraterritorial NIACs uh, or in international coalitions against armed groups that are 
um, taken with or without consent of states. And that might be a, a, a good uh, way to, um, to bring in some policy considerations uh, that should have been brought by our panelists, but that I will bring forward to you for the sake of discussion. And perhaps I will, uh, I will quote your article here, where you say that um, accepting the approach that you're proposing uh, could lead to a process of reflection and discussion among like-minded states and other parties that would try to develop common standards about when the use of legal force and detention against members of armed groups should be understood as necessary and proportionate in the face of the security threats that such group presents. So you do want to launch your theoretical um, approach in the policy sphere. So what could be uh, those policy considerations that state might have? Well, first of all, I think that one possible object objection would be, uh, well, which, which, uh, which are thoughts, in fact, brought by, uh, by uh, the, the, the third panelist, so, so not mine, but that could be uh, indeed uh, those objection, objections that we should not impose unrealistic obligations on states. Um, because if we uh, impose unrealistic uh, obligations on states, uh, they will not be able to respect those obligations. And not only would they not be able to respect um, obligations under human rights law, but at the end it would be counterproductive because in the long term um, they could be less inclined to comply with the law in general. So that would be uh, one of the objections. Uh, so the need to be pragmatic when applying the law to concrete situations. Uh, and to have perhaps a, a, a comprehensive approach taking into account all aspects of the issue. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps I will also um, forward uh, some views uh, about your articles, um, which um, uh, you, you might want to address as well, is that there might be um, a disagreement that uh, the use of that, that there is no justification for the use of force by states in their uh, counterterrorism or in their military operation, um, because, for example, and you quote this also in your article, um, uh, many states did justify their action under the use of ad venom and the, the, the charter um, for in the charter law. Uh, that was the case in Mali, where the UN uh, SC resolution uh, 2085 gave author authorization to use force and all necessary means uh, to offer assistance to reduce the threat posed by terrorist organizations. That was the case also in the Central African Republic uh, for France. Uh, Iraq demanded, um, there was a demand by the local authorities to assist them. Uh, and of course, it's much more complicated in Syria, as you know. Perhaps you want to address this issue, <coughs> where in Syria there was no consent by the state. Yeah. So in that case, how do we do? Um, uh, but uh, in any case, in all these situations, states did invoke self-defense. The U.S. does invoke self-defense even in, their, in its targeting operation, uh, arguing for uh, also the, the level of threat that certain individuals might cause. Uh, so here, um, isn't it enough that the U.N. Charter gives this uh, authorization uh, to use force? Do we need an extra authorization from human rights law? Okay, so these are, let me try and answer these questions. And I should say, um, as a preface, that, you know, because I, I work for a think tank, um, not for an academic research institution. So to me, it's, you know, it's kind of part of my job to come up with things that are not only really theoretically interesting, but that also um, are going to, you know, be seen as practically relevant by the organizations that, you know, ultimately give us funding. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I'm keen because I think, you know, this, um, my um, article came out of seeing what I thought were, you know, real problems in the real world um, to do with, you know, differences and debates about what seemed to be a kind of um, use of force by states, um, particularly the United States, um, that, you know, that somehow seemed to be undermining the international rule of law, but that they claimed were perfectly in, in keeping with the law. Um, so it's important that, what you know, to me, that what I um, am recommending should be seen as, as practicable. Um, 
as possible in practice as well as in theory. Um, and I think it is. And the reason I think that is actually, um, in most cases, state practice has kind of lagged a little bit behind um, the, the you know, full extent of the legal theories that states have tended to set out. In other words, states have made these very um, expansive legal arguments that we can target anyone who's fighting on the other side, um, that we can detain anyone until the end of hostilities if we merely establish that they're a member of the non-state group. Um, but in practice, they often you know, don't do these things because they recognize that it's not militarily necessary. Um, and also, I think they recognize that in some way it's kind of morally problematic. Um, so, for instance, you know, even in the United States, um, which has certainly been at the forefront of making these expansive legal claims, you know, President Obama, um, concerned partly about international reputation and I think partly um, with reflecting his own concerns, put in place a series of restrictions um, in what he called the presidential policy guidance. Um, which were, as he said, policy restrictions limiting the U.S. use of drone strikes. Um, and these strikes, you know, when they were away from battlefield conditions, um, could only be used against people who posed um, what they described as a continuing imminent threat to U.S. persons. Now, you know, some of us might have trouble with working out what a continuing and imminent threat <laughs> is. Um, but nevertheless, at least there was a gesture there, I think, towards the idea of a threat-based rather than simply a status-based rule. Um, and similarly, um, Obama also put in place, with respect to the people in Guantanamo, um, these kinds of hearings that were going to determine whether the individuals continued to pose a threat that would justify their detention. Um, and he emphasized that both of these restrictions were not legally required, but they were being done on a policy basis. Um, and I think if you look at what France has done, actually, in its use of force in Mali, for instance, which you quoted, um, you know, French officials, and I've spoken to them about this, they do say, well, in practice, we are make, you know, very sure not to use force beyond what's strictly necessary, um, because we know that we want to retain the goodwill of the populations, and we tailor our operations to what's legally required. You know, and in many other cases, as I show in the article, states are using force, in any case, under a kind of... Um, individual or unit self-defense rules of engagement, which is, you know, you only attack those who are threatening you rather than simply, I think. So I think in some ways the, um, you know, the kind of legal claims that the states are making are running ahead of what they want to do, but they're trying to give themselves greater powers, uh, which to my mind is, is dangerous, but, you know, but I think if you look at what's realistic, it could actually probably be pulled back to something like the, the claims that I'm trying to put forward. Um, and to deal very quickly with the second point, you know, isn't there, um, isn't there a justification when we're acting extraterritorially um, for why we're using force in these countries? Um, and absolutely, there is. Um, you know, you can't simply march into another country and use force. Um, the UN Charter makes that uh, unlawful, and that's prohibition. Um, on the use of threat of force is the kind of, as I quote someone in my paper, it's a cornerstone of international rule of law. Um, but, you know, if you think what it, what it stops and what it doesn't stop, it stops the use of force in the territory of another state without the consent of that state, unless justified by um, self-defense or unless justified by a security council resolution. Um, but most of the problematic uses of force in the different campaigns against terrorism have taken place with the consent of the states where they take place. You know, even the drone strikes, which are the notorious US, you know, potential violation of, of international law, mostly they take place in Pakistan, in Yemen, you know, in Somalia, in Libya. Um, in almost all of these cases, you know, to at least some degree, with some ambiguity, um, the states have essentially given their consent to the use of force. And the problem with looking only to the UN Charter as a framework for justification is that when the state consents, um, that kind of text disappears. Um, as it does, incidentally, when a state uses force within its own territory, the UN Charter is, is irrelevant to that. And so if you want to have any framework um, for this use of force by a state against individuals, that's not, as it were, crossing the boundaries of a state, an unconsenting state, 
then I think you know any test that's going to make that confined to what's necessary and proportionate to a legitimate purpose, um, then I think we have to look at human rights. That would be my answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Marco, now. Uh... Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I have to start with three disclaimers for the first time mm -hmm. since 17 years. I now have to start to say I speak only for myself because you mentioned that I'm special advisor of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and I would never advise her to use this theory, but uh, this is for criminal law reasons. Um, and second, I'm sorry that I'm a man and we are two male panelists. But if you want, I go out. She knows very much. About it. <laughs> and and uh, the third point is, do I understand correctly that all students in this room have already p uh, passed their exam or written their exams? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the ones of the them. Yeah. We waited. I'm not only the students in the room. So ah, yeah. No, no. Because he, because he's in your <laughs> no. Because <laughs> there is <laughs> one. <laughs> there is one. You <laughs> can get no, no. You can get. Very confused if you put use of bellum and human rights together and things like that. <laughs> but but read is, his article. Read to, to write the papers. So oh, yeah. Okay. Them yeah. Further. No, but anyway, when you read, uh, write papers, you read uh, first papers. And so I recommend <laughs> to read his article, which, in my view, is on all issues correct, and then you can always say uh, you don't agree and you see it differently. Uh, uh, because when I started to read it, I thought, what is this? <laughs> Human rights are used at bello. But uh, no, this is not his point. So, uh, and I agree that it is. Uh, it's big lacuna that we don't have a use ad bellum internum, which means we don't have rules of international law uh, saying when is it lawful for a state or for a, a non-state actor to uh, start a non-international armed conflict. Personally, I think a state can never start a non-international armed conflict, and this is because of human rights law. And therefore, I have a certain sympathy with your <laughs> idea. It must always wait until an armed group starts, and then it can, because it must always try to uh, stop an insurgency by uh, law enforcement measures. And it is only if the group um, comes up to a level of armed conflict, then it can uh, fight according to rules of armed conflict. Now, I think at the end, with the practical result, we agree simply to fill in the time. I want to tell you how differently one could see it. I think IHL does not justify anything. Um, and this is essential for IHL because uh, otherwise it would justify war, including war of aggression, which obviously is not uh, the case. It doesn't give a right. At best, it gives a right within IHL. And then I'm a dinosaur. Those of you who are specialized in international law know the Lotus case. I belong to the very small minority of people who still believe in the Lotus rule, which is everything which is not prohibited is lawful. And therefore, when a state goes to action, they ideally, which is unfortunately not the case, they ask their legal advisor, uh, do I violate any rule of international law? What, I play, what I, I'm planning to do and not. Uh, do I have a justification under international law to do this? The only field where you need a justification is in human rights law, because human rights law so says that you must have a legal basis and do it for certain admissible reasons. So I'm not criticizing what you are right, because you agree with that. Uh, so, um, now, obviously, it has already been mentioned by Anissa that 
uh, to see human rights law as use ad bellum in non-international armed conflict. It works only if we accept, which is a small minority opinion, but which is eminent in this building, <laughs> that human rights law applies extraterritorially across the board, even when you send a missile around the globe. This person on whom you send the missile is under the jurisdiction, because otherwise there is a big gap, because you don't have your rules at bed. And then I simply wonder whether human rights law too is not uh, simply a limitation. Human rights law says states may do what they want, except they have to respect human rights and the right to life. And then there are exceptions to the right to life, but the whole regime I wouldn't say the justification to kill someone is human rights law. Human rights lawyers would be quite uh, nervous about this. In my view, it's similar to humanitarian law. It's also simply a restrictive regime. And then we come to a little technicality of human rights law, that human rights law requires a legal basis, which is not the case for human law for killing someone. So even if you fulfill all the conditions, you must have a legal basis. In domestic law, which it's okay, I agree with you, states could if they wanted to have such legislation, but they don't have, which shows that they don't think that they need the legislation for such action. And therefore, your use at Bello must be a slightly modified human rights law. You cannot simply copy paste the requirements of the European Convention, except if you say the legal basis is humanitarian law, and this you don't say because it's then obviously think uh, circular. So I wonder whether um, it's not better. And this is my approach to first wonder whether humanitarian law or human rights law, even when both apply, constitutes what I call the leg specialis. And I know, especially in this building, there are plenty of people who don't like this term. And I understand them because the term has been misused. But you know, self defense has also been misused. And I don't know any professor in international law who says, don't speak about self-defense because it has so often been misused. OK, so in my view, you would have to determine when both apply, which means there's an armed conflict, and you target a person in a non-international armed conflict, whether human rights law or human, humanitarian law constitutes the Lex Specialis on this specific targeting. And as you know, my proposal is that uh, it depends on whether this is a kind of coast uh, uh, conduct of hostilities uh, situation where you uh, use force against organized armed forces uh, in the field who are not under your control, or against a lone fighter in Bogota. That was the classical example. Today we have to find a new plan. And then, uh, once you have determined that, in my view, then if humanitarian law is the lex specialis, you don't need a justification. Because humanitarian law simply says, don't do A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And if you don't do this, it's not prohibited by humanitarian law. While if uh, human rights law constitutes a lex specialis, then you need a legal basis. and humanitarian law cannot be the legal basis to justify, this is my opinion at least, to justify the use of force if human rights law applies uh, to the use of force. Uh, so uh, the difference between us, because in, if you read his article, his main 
counter argument against my electrical Charis approach is uh, simply uh, assuming that Lex Specialis means, which it means for many people, in armed conflict, IHL applies and human rights law doesn't apply. And this is wrong. This is obviously wrong. And now, some people I respect very much therefore say, don't use this term, you are working for the enemy market. <laughs> While I say, no, they misunderstand the term. In my view, both human rights law and humanitarian law can constitute the leg specialist depending on the specific uh, uh, problem. And your criticism to say, which would be totally correct, you cannot see how in a non-international armed conflict for certain targeting, um, uh, humanitarian law uh, provides a justification and for others not, is I counter it by saying it never provides a justification. Simply, in some situation, it doesn't constitute a leg speciality. For me, the loan say Chechen fighter in Vladivostok, if the Russian security forces want to arrest him, they have to apply human rights law, although he, sorry, it's again a man, but uh, yes, there were plenty of female, female Chechen fighters, but they are not in Vladivostok. <laughs> and is a, a legitimate target, but simply human rights law for an obligation operation in Vladivostok constitutes the Lex Specialis, and therefore you don't even ask whether there's a justification under uh, human rights, uh, humanitarian law. You apply uh, a human rights law, and this at the end leads uh, to the same results as the ones you suggest, I would simply answer to your policy arguments. It is an incredible tendency of the military to consider, not all military in the world, but most military uh, we know and who are outspoken, to see human rights law as something totally unrealistic. And it is not. I mean, it's very flexible, but I know we agree with that. And I'm absolutely sure that, uh, no, I cannot say I'm absolutely sure, because sometimes they, but every court makes some mistakes, even the International Criminal Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> but here, uh, most of the time, human rights bodies will be in a given case, not in a general comment, be sufficiently flexible to take into account the armed conflict environment and therefore even the immediacy of the threat, because that's another weakness if you take at least the jurisprudence of the European Court on Human Rights seriously, you would say in many of the cases, even on the battlefield, this would not be a sufficient immediate threat. I mean, even if on the battlefield I'm eating my lunch, the European Court on Human Rights for its peacetime jurisprudence would never accept that uh, the person who is eating uh, her lunch is a legitimate target. While I understand that you would agree that when they are in the unit of the armed group, not under the control of the state, and the state sends in a missile, you would say, okay, if they eat their lunch or not, the lunch is nevertheless immediate threat. But I think human rights bodies would be sufficiently uh, flexible. By the way, perhaps you have found an explanation for a recent Israeli Supreme Court decision, which is very astonishing and which at least students would say mixes humanitarian law and human rights law in a very strange way uh, because it says on the one hand these are legitimate targets in an armed conflict and at the same time they try to convince us and I don't speak about the facts huh? uh, just about the law they try to convince it that in every individual case there was an immediate threat to human life and so to say why do they do that uh, and you would have given an explanation 
that they say, okay, there's an armed conflict, but we still need, uh, which is not what they say, but uh, we still need an additional justification. So, thank you. Well, thank you to both of you. Can um, I come back very quickly? Sure, sure, Just sure. Very briefly on, on what Marco said, because um, on the first point, um, you know, human rights law similarly is a limitation. I completely agree. And, um, you know, if I could go back now, I think I maybe in my article I kind of got a little bit carried away in one or two places. And because I was arguing so much um, against the idea that um, IHL is kind of authorizing in some way, um, I perhaps went a little bit far in kind of using language that suggests that human rights law is authorizing or justifying. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to clarify that it, that it's not, but you know, what I think there is still a significant difference that this gets to, um, which is that you know there's a, a legal regime, um, and um, the legal regime essentially is one that places limits on the state's um, you know lawful power to use force against those under its jurisdiction, and that's the legal regime of human rights law. So um, you know you can say that the the regime provides a, a framework for assessing when the use of force is justified. Um, and the human rights law is, you know, it's based on restrictions on the use of force, but the, you know, the overall effect of having a regime of kind of graduated restrictions on the use of force, you know, which allows the state to use force progressively, you know, as the threats against it increase, is to provide a framework for justification. I mean, in this way, I would argue that the function of human rights law, um, you know, or its place in this regime of justification, which is, you know, state sovereignty qualified by human rights law, um, is, is nevertheless functioning in a different way than the restrictive regime of IHL. Um, because the restrictive regime of IHL is, you know, is placing restrictions on the conduct of hostilities. Um, but it's not placing restrictions, you know, it's not going to the question of whether force is, you know, is overall justified or not. Um, and therefore, I think it's, you know, the kind of the function and the structure of the legal regimes are doing something a little bit different. Um, so that, um, you know, in a sense, the, the ability of the state to, you know, I mean, uh, you sat down also is a restrictive regime. It's restricting the circumstances under which states can use force against another state. Um, but the kind of functional impact is that the powers of sovereignty combined with the restrictions of use ad bellum set up a, a framework for justification for the use of force. Um, and similarly, I think, this is my parallel argument, the, you know, the, the authority of state sovereignty over the people under its jurisdiction you know, combined with the kind of graduated restrictions that human rights law imposes on that, set up a regime of justification. Um, and I think, you know, the, the way this operates is to allow, you know, circumstances on which the state effectively has the authority to use force. Um, and so IHL is not providing, I mean, uh, human rights law is not providing the justification, but it's kind of regulating the justification in that way. Um, and I think, you know, because there is this essential difference that human rights law, when it assesses an act of force, it's assessing it in relation to the purpose, the end that the act of force is supposed to serve. You know, is it necessary and proportionate um, that this act should be done in order to protect life, in order to suppress an insurrection or whatever? Um, Whereas the, um, the assessment that's carried out under the conduct of hostilities rule is not looking at the kind of overall end or purpose of the act. It's only looking at its contribution to military effort. And this was the point that you made. That's why the IHL regime doesn't you know, get to the question of whether the force is being used for a, a good purpose or a bad purpose. It simply is, you know, that's why both sides in a, in a conflict um, benefit from the principle of military necessity, why they both have restrictions and permissions under IHL, you know, that's a sort of self-contained regime that only, that takes for granted that force is being used, um, but it doesn't go to the question of whether the force is being used for a purpose that justifies it, whereas the regime in which human rights law sits, I think, does go to that. And to me, that's, um, 
that makes it, and this is why I would argue against you that, the, that my framework that I'm proposing, you know, has advantages over your framework of looking to um, of looking to IHL in some cases and of looking to human rights law because I think you know it's more coherent in a way that when you're looking at the justification for the use of force, you're always looking to the framework that's, you know, that places restrictions on the state's use of force against the individuals under its jurisdiction. Um, and I think, you know, essentially what you're saying is, on those circumstances where we're in a battlefield situation, um, you know, in those very limited circumstances, there's no problem for human rights law to kind of defer to IHL. Um, but I don't really still see what IHL essentially adds to that. Because one could equally say, you know, in these circumstances, um, human rights law tolerates the use of force based on status. Because there's a sufficient threat in this context, you know, the force is necessary and proportionate, and one can assume that because of the circumstances. So, you know, why is it, um, what is it bringing in, in addition to say, no, um, it's not that IHL is, uh, not the human rights law is responding to the, you know, the specific context and what's necessary and proportionate in that context, but it's kind of, in that context, it's deferring to IHL. To me, that sort of seems to have a, an unnecessary complication. May I just on this say something? Yeah. No, just, you have a good point. If all we do know hadn't been around and no one had ever made uh, IHL, we would assess every armed conflict situation under human rights law. But simply, fortunately, in my view, because it is much more detailed, realistic, it contains a whole uh, detailed regime on conduct of facilities, we have IHL, and therefore, when there is the typical IHL situation, indeed, human rights law defers to IHL, while the mere fact that an armed conflict is around is not a sufficient argument, but I know we agree that, uh, on that to say now there's an armed conflict and therefore IHL is the leg specialis on the use of force. And when the term was used by the International Court of Justice in the Nuclear Weapons Advisory Opinion, I have to remind you, not you, but everyone else, that this was in the context of an in abstracto evaluation of the lawfulness of a weapon. And there, indeed, when it comes to the right to life, there's a good argument to say uh, that uh, IHL is the, the lex specialis. While when it comes to the justification of killing one individual, uh, it can be both IHL and human rights law, which in my view can constitute a lex specialis. And I agree with you that there is a structural difference in the sense that the distinction between use of bellum and use in bellum is crucial for IHL, but doesn't exist in human rights law, which nevertheless leads to some results which are not totally uh, realistic, but academically fully right, because you agree. This means if there is an unlawful occupation, every act of the occupying power violates human rights law. Every use of force by the occupying power, and even self-defense by a soldier who is attacked by a local activist, self-defense Fortunately, we have a criminal lawyer here. And mm -hmm. uh, self-defense is obviously only against uh, uh, unlawful attacks, and it would not no longer be. Uh, uh, no, it's only against unlawful attacks, while here, this us, it is the, the activist who will act lawfully. And this leads to a theoretically correct and coherent regime, but which is not very much helpful, I think, for the people affected by armed conflict and occupation. And this is a problem. So perhaps now is the time that we all participate in the discussion. So I open the floor for question. Uh, before asking the question, short question, and introduce yourself. Okay. I'm in the summer course of international law 
at the University of Geneva. And my question is this. From both dissertations, I, I could get that you both think there are lacunas that they need to be filled. And there are many challenges related to fragmentation of international law. So my question is, what is your opinion regarding the use of soft law in, to resolve this kind of conflicts and, and lacunas that we you're facing when we need to apply international humanitarian law and human rights law. And also, if you think that nowadays these, these tools, guidance, and other instruments of soft law are being used by international actors to resolve these kind of problems. Perhaps I take a couple of questions. I, so, yes? Um, Catalina, I'm also with the Summer Curse on international law, international humanitarian law. And my question is more uh, pointed towards where do you draw the line of necessity in the use of force in non-international armed conflicts? If we follow the idea of human rights being used as use of value in non-international armed conflicts, then it would seem that, for instance, a targeted killing will always be illegal. So when it comes to the specific attack, the moment in the attack, would human rights law still be the lex specialis or the use of felon in the non-international armed conflict? Or we would uh, be in a scenario in which international law for the purpose of the attack would be the one applicable? Yes, the third question. Yes, Dishet. Uh, hi, my name is Dishet. I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross. I was just wondering if you could flesh out a little bit more uh, the aspect of collective versus individual use of force, because it seems that, at least in international conflict, when we have, when we talk about ad bellum, we're talking about somehow a collective use of force, and then you talked about how that translates to individual use of force, whereas it seems that when you're talking about uh, human rights law, you're always talking about individual use of force. So we're not talking here about an ad bellum, but we're talking always about um, somehow an individual justification. So it's not about when you can start a non-international conflict, it's when you can target a person always. So I wondered if you could flesh that out. Okay, thank you very much for these good questions. Um, so on the first one, um, I think I mean, I think there is a there is a lacuna kind of in the way that these bodies of law are commonly seen as um, as interacting, um, and the, there is a lacuna in the way that we kind of commonly assess, to my mind, the use of force in non-international armed conflict because we are missing this kind of normative dimension. Um, but you know, I think I don't know whether this would count as soft law or not. I think the you know, as it were, if we think through what the function um, you know, and kind of underlying purpose of the different legal regimes is, that there is kind of sufficient law there. Um, and so it's more to do with how the law is being interpreted um, and applied. Um, but I think that the, the legal frameworks you know, exist. Um, in some cases, I think there are big questions about, and this takes me on some of the other things, as to how they apply in particular circumstances. You know, how does the, the right to life apply in the context of, um, you know, reasonably organized hostilities by an armed group is very much an open question. Um, and I think there's still some open questions also about the tension. Um, so in both of these areas, you know, there are real issues. If we think of human rights law as playing this role, and so to my mind, it's, you know, I, you know, I don't, I'm not so much saying this, you know, this kind of, um, approach is going to clearly provide the answers, but it's going to, as it were, kind of slightly reshape the terms under which we debate it. Um, and I think, you know, clearly there are going to be human rights groups and there are going to be, um, you know, states, armed forces and war fighting states that are going to take rather different views on what, you know, makes the use of force necessary and proportionate in specific circumstances. Um, but I, I think it would be helpful to have everyone on the same page in terms of making that argument. Um, and to my mind, that's one of the attractions of this. It, you know, and that's part of the, my interest in getting a sort of policy dialogue going, is partly to sell to states the idea that this doesn't kind of pres necessarily prescribe certain um, you know, kind of prohibitions that you might be uncomfortable with. It's more a way of saying, OK, you should at least be justifying your actions according to this framework. So I don't know if that answers your thing. Um, so this is going to the necessity question. I mean, this to me is really a kind of 
an open question. Um, and certainly, you know, there are interpretations of human rights law that would make it, you know, essentially always unlawful to use force against an individual who's away from the battlefield and who's not at that moment posing an immediate threat. Um, but I think that that is not necessarily the case. Um, and I think there are, you know, there are, for instance, ways of, I mean, I guess one is, you know, we tend to think that human rights law requires an imminent threat to life in order to justify targeting. But um, whether that applies in the context of uh, suppressing an insurrection, does that still require an actual imminent threat to life? I don't know. I mean, states are kind of a little bit, I think, trying to work out where they stand on this. Um, and so the United States, and I know this actually because I spoke to people who worked on these legal frameworks, um, when they were thinking about what they were going to use in the presidential policy guidance, you know, they felt that they had to keep imminence in there, even though they actually wanted to get rid of imminence, because they thought imminence was not the appropriate test under, it's, in this case, it was US constitutional law rather than human rights law, but it was going to the same place. Um, but they thought that imminence needed to be there because it would kind of cause too much of a controversy if they took it out. And so that's how they came up with this thing of the continuing imminence, right? <laughs> Which, I, you know, I really don't think is helping the matter. You know, but there are other people who say, well, um, it, it has to be an imminent threat, except in the case of a continuing campaign of hostility, say, by a terrorist group, um, and you have someone who's sufficiently high up in the group um, that he might not be posing an imminent threat at that moment, but he's nevertheless directing a campaign of violence, and this is still you know, necessary and proportionate to stopping that. Um, or it could be a specialist within the group who is kind of regularly making bombs but not doing one at that moment. Um, you know, and so this is getting closer to some of the more status-based things. So I think there's a, you know, this is an unresolved area where I don't absolutely know what I think. But I think, you know, I actually don't incline to the view that um, a targeted killing of an individual who's not at that moment threatening anyone, I don't think that's automatically going to be a violation of human rights. I think, you know, it could be or it might not be. Um, and we need to debate where that line is. Um, so on the individual and collective thing, I mean, this is a kind of central part of the, um, of the claim I'm trying to make in the article. Um, and it really revolves around this difference between um, international and non-international armed conflict. You know, international armed conflict, it's a conflict between two equal collective bodies. Um, and, um, you know, when one state goes to war against each other, another, um, it's the, the use of force is authorized on that level, and they kind of operate as, you know, on, on this basis of formal equality, right? They're, they're similar entities um, using force against each other, and um, they're both bound by this, you know, the same laws. But I think when the state is using force against individuals under its jurisdiction, um, the situation is very different because there's this inherent asymmetry. Um, you know, the state is never giving any kind of um, entitlement um, to use force to the individuals under its control. Um, so, you know, it could always be uh, an act of treason for a rebel group to take up arms against the state. Um, you know, whereas in an international armed conflict, it's not that. You know, an individual combatant has a combatant's privilege, they can't be prosecuted under criminal law on the other side. Um, and so I think, you know, because it, the state is continuing to assert its jurisdiction in this way, um, then I think that that means that, yes, the use of force is always going to be assessed on an individual basis. I mean, it could be that, um, you know, that the individual is found in a circumstance where it's a battlefield circumstance, and so you can just assume that membership in a, an armed group that's fighting on a battlefield is enough for the individual assessment of threat. Because automatically, you know, everyone in that group could meet the individual threshold. Um, but it still is notionally being assessed on that individual basis. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, to me that is kind of appropriate in a way for a non-international armed conflict situation. Because, the, you know, as I said, the, the non-state group is always notionally committing a crime. Um, and therefore, the state should have to justify its actions against each individual. It's not elevating the opposing group to a position of equality where it can't hold it accountable under criminal law. Um, and that would, you know, I think that applies in a way that, that makes that 
um, appropriate. But it does set up this kind of complex situation, in my view, um, in a non-international armed conflict, which is you have these two legal regimes, one of which is the legal regime that's assessing the, author you know, the authorization for the use of force, the justification for the use of force, which the state um, has to justify it on an individual basis, and the non-state group, I think, you know, as currently situated, is never going to acquire that authority to use force, because it can always be prosecuted for doing so. Um, so that's the regime for the use of force, which is individual, but the regime for the conduct of hostilities, which continues to apply alongside, I'm not saying that IHL is being displaced, you know, that's applying to the collective, to two collective bodies that are fighting the, the conflict, and it's applying symmetrically to both parties. So, you know, and this is one of the kind of complexities of the approach I suggest, is you have these two parallel regimes, one governing the justification, which is collective, you know, the state against the individual, and one looking at the conduct of hostilities, which is one party to the conflict against another party to the conflict. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but, you know, I think this a little bit could answer the point that Marco was making as well, that I think the, um, you know, the conduct of hostilities rules are still there, and they're still restricting what the states can do, um, and, you know, they might still imply that the state was committing war crimes, um, and both sides are bound equally by that. But I think we should see the justification for the use of force as performing a slightly separate role, you know, and only really giving that justification to the state. So you're looking puzzled, but we can yeah, see this discussion. <laughs> Just before taking another question, Mark, you want to Just for the benefit of the students in the room, he doesn't say that human rights law is only about necessity and proportionality. I mean, there, there is still a need to reconcile human rights law and humanitarian law on plenty of other things, like the on the right to life, the obligation to make an inquiry, and so on. It is yeah. simply, he takes out one element of human rights law and elevates it to a kind of use of bellum. Your soft law question is very interesting. My provisional answer is soft law has less importance in humanitarian law and unfortunately the soft law is produced by either the humanitarian law or the human rights law community. So to the best of my knowledge, it's only in some academic settings, and this doesn't produce soft law, that there is an attempt to reconcile the two. So for instance, the ICSC guidance on direct participation on hostilities is, and it says explicitly, we don't deal with human rights law. So it's purely, if you want to call it, and I call it so, but the ICSC would never call it soft law. It, because it's always so uh, Geneva Calvinist that it would say it's nothing. We, it's not even an interpretation, it's just our idea. But this is soft law, and the human rights bodies have a great tendency, with some exceptions, to produce purely human rights soft law. The meaning of necessity, we should not forget that both humanitarian law and human rights law have very detailed rules on what is necessity, and probably in your next article you will explain as which, which exactly elements of necessity in humanitarian law and in human rights law uh, count for this kind of use ad bellum necessity and collective versus individual. Indeed, that was also one of my reactions, but you have calmed me down. Uh, obviously, a, a non-international armed conflict is also a collective event. There's no armed conflict without a party. And therefore, you cannot see it purely as an individual question. And this is probably nevertheless, and thank you for the remark, um, a weakness in your theory that then on the use ad bellum level of, we call it, suddenly the group disappears and it's only the individual who counts. Okay, next round of questions. So I will go behind, but please. <laughs> yes. Um, I, my question is about the policy um, kind of arguments 
because you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're you're keeping a separation between the human rights law rules, application of the human rights law rules, and the IHL rules. But in practice, they're both dealing with use of force. And so, in practice, for states, I mean, I can just hear the argument, which would be it would create an unequal playing field where the armed groups they're fighting against aren't restricted, even if you say it's not necessarily a restriction. I think that states would see it as a restriction or fear the restriction that the armed groups aren't bound by that same layer and so I wonder how you how you counter how you would counter or have countered that pushback just oh sorry yeah I'm uh, Sasha Radin at ICRC and I was at the uh, US Naval War College George uh, Brooks, thank you I will thank you Academy. Um, thank you for the presentation and you touched upon the question of equality of belligerence as well uh, and you brought forward some of the differences that you see in non-international armed conflicts uh, most of the time uh, we suppose that states are more organized than non state armed groups and then you raised also the specificities of use of lethal force by states and how it could be different for non state actors because uh, it could be the, the case that uh, the such use of lethal force is never justified from human rights law perspective from non state armed groups you mentioned. Uh, so, my question was some have made a claim that human rights law applies to non state armed groups in specific contexts. If your position to this would be that you agree with this position, then based on the equality of belligerence, what could be the implications of? giving equal obligations to non-state actors, whether they should comply with human rights standards of using lethal force. And here I'm not talking about the legal basis, but other standards of absolute necessity, for example. And if you would agree that in specific instances, if we are claiming this for states, as for, so, for non-state actors as well, human rights law then could be less special for use of lethal force. Thank you. Third question. Yes, yes. I'm from the Mission Street Center. I would like to just to take one clear example to understand the key point of view. If we take the situation in Syria, and you have the Syrian state trying to kill a, a terrorist commander that's going in the vicinity of Raqqa, that they have no control anymore. In your view, you will apply human rights law. If you have Russia trying to kill the same commander, you will apply IHL. So how can you reconcile two different set of laws for the same target in the same position? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, so three more quite uh, challenging questions. Um, so, to take them in order. Um, and I guess the, you know, the, the first and the second question are going to somewhat similar points. Um, so I, I actually don't think that I am creating, or I, you know, this, I don't think that this legal um, proposal of mine is actually setting up the kind of unequal playing field that, um, you know, that you might think states would be worried about. Um, because I actually think in non-international armed conflicts, states begin with, you know, the most unequal playing field is one that's imposed by the state to begin with. Um, and that's the idea that the, um, the opposing party, the non-state group, you know, can never um, carry out a, an act that's kind of, um, you know, inherently lawful. Um, and so, you know, for instance, take a military operation carried out by um, Al-Qaeda, you know, they um, Yeah. Right. So the um, you know the attack. I'm trying to remember which one it was. You know when they attacked the, the there was a ship in Arden, I think it was attacked. Right. This was pre 2011. Um, it was a military operation against a military target. You know carried out by Canada. Nevertheless, um, under U.S. law, that's a criminal act. Um, and the United States will hold those individuals accountable for that act. Um, and the states, all states would do the same. So in that sense, you know, you can say that the domestic law um, provides a kind of um, 
prohibition on the use of force, on the resort to force, by you know individuals against the state. Um, and this is something that Marco has actually written in the past. I don't know if you would stand by it. <laughs> but in your article on Yusuf Bella and Yusuf Bella, you make this point. Um, so, you know, it is functioning on a, in a way that, you know, the um, non-state groups never have that kind of entitlement to use force against the state that would override prosecution under the state's domestic laws. Um, and, the, you know, I think this is setting up an inherent asymmetry so that you have a situation in the U.S. campaign against Al-Qaeda where, you know, the U.S. is essentially claiming the right to use force um, you know, against any member of the enemy, or to detain them until the you know the end of hostilities, which is 15 years and counting, 20 years and counting. Take it back before 9/11. Um, you know, while denying, essentially denying um, the fighters on the other side, you know, any right to use force at all, such that they could still be prosecuted um, legally and imprisoned or you know executed for acts of, you know, even military actions against US forces. And I'm not talking just about holding them as, you know, as detainees, but they, you know, they could mention to be prosecuted as well, um, and subject to the death penalty. So, um, you know, I think there is an asymmetry in, in terms of the resort to force, the justification for the use of force, um, which is there. And I think, if anything, what my proposal is doing is kind of slightly modifying that asymmetry by, you know, putting some restrictions on the resort to force on the part of the state that, you know, that you might say are appropriate in light of the fact that the state is, you know, is permitting no resort, no possibility for resort to force, essentially, to the, to the non-state group. You know, but they are equal in terms of the restrictions imposed on the conduct of hostilities. Um, and this is a key, absolutely key point for me. Um, you know, they are bound by the same rules as far as methods and means of warfare, treatment of detainees, um, you know, all of the canon that's there in IHL continues to apply, it continues, both sides have to um, comply with it, you know, everything in common law three, everything in customary law, um, any other, you know, protocols that might apply. I mean, all of this is, is applying equally, um, and that's imposing significant restrictions on both sides, but you know, that I think go in some way to equalize it. Now, um, you know, so I guess I don't have necessarily have too much to add to, to your question, because I think that does go to it. I mean, you know, I don't think that you really need to think about whether human rights law is kind of regulating the use of force by the non-state group, um, because the non-state group has to comply with rules on the conduct of hostilities. Um, but it might at the same time also, um, you know, it's, it's not really acquiring any entitlement to use force that would override the state's domestic laws. So, you know, I think this, the non-state group continues to be at a disadvantage. Um, but, you know, as to whether human rights law might apply to, you know, I, I, I can see a group that has control over territory, you know, might well be subject to human rights law as to the, those individuals who fall within that territory. And, you know, that could perhaps apply to captured members of the state's armed forces, or um, it could apply to other people within that territory. Um, so in a way, that's a sort of slightly separate question, but I think there are good grounds for thinking in some circumstances those obligations would be there. Um, the Syria question, um, I mean, Syria is a really interesting case, and it's um, because you essentially have three different kinds of things going on in Syria. You have the state using force against the terrorist groups or and rebel groups. Um, you have those countries that are present on Syrian territory with the consent of Syria to use force against terrorist groups, which is Russia and Iran. Um, and then you have um, you know, members of the international coalition of the United States and several European countries that are using force without the consent, against the same targets in some cases, without the consent of the host state. Um, I actually think that this, you know, essentially the same legal regime would apply in the case of Russia and the Syrian regime. You know, because Russia is using force with the consent of the Syrian state, um, and therefore it's, you know, it's, it's not a violation of the UN Charter rules. Um, essentially, I think it is bound by the same regime, I would argue, the Russian use of force against rebels. Um, and in fact, to my mind, this is one of the arguments in favor of my framework. You know, it would seem odd to have a different regime between the, the Syrian 
government, which I think you know is clearly bound by human rights law, and the Russian forces that are operating alongside with their consent. Um, but the situation for the coalition is different because they have to meet the test of USAP Bellum because they don't have Syrian state consent. Um, and therefore, you know, the, their use of force has to be um, justified as necessary and proportionate for the, um, whether it's the defense, collective defense of Iraq or the individual self-defense of France or the United States or whatever. Um, you know, as to how the obligations imposed by that relate to the human rights obligations, that's a, a complicated question, which I think I'm going to defer to my next article along with Mark. <laughs> he has found, you have found, and I didn't find that, it's the weakest point of your whole theory, because suddenly the US then would no longer be bound by these human rights-like restrictions, but only by the use of bellum and by IHL, which it nevertheless, also the two words necessity and proportionality appear both in use of bellum and in human rights law, they have a very different meaning. And this indeed would be strange that Russia and the US are not bound by the same rules when they attack IS targets in Syria. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's a, it, I think it's an open question whether they would be bound by the same rules or not. You know, and I think that it would go. You have to assess first of all how far does the USAID bellum um, application in this case, you know, create a, an essentially similar set of restrictions to those of human rights, and if not. You know, then perhaps you would have to think whether human rights law was also still yeah, uh, addition, you know, in addition applicable. And I'm not ruling it out mm -hmm. by any means. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's an unresolved question how far human rights applies to those kinds of military mm -hmm. actions that are carried out extraterritorially without the consent of the state. But you know, I would be sympathetic to the idea that human rights law is there. And so, if we think that human rights law is imposing additional restrictions beyond the use of that, then I guess the the coalition would have to. Um, comply with those. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I you know I think that there would be uh, an equality of, uh, of restrictions. But it's a very good point. Very good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think it's now 2:20. So I'm guessing that it's the end of uh, of our talk. It's the last IHR talk uh, of the academic year. So I think we finished en beauté. Uh, thank you for your participation. I think